Welcome to the Echo Ratings Eventing Podcast. Welcome to the Echo Ratings Eventing Podcast and another episode of A Cup of Tea with very kindly supported by NAF. Now, today's guest was the youngest rider at the London Olympic Games. He has been a stalwart of the Swedish team over the last sort of decade, I guess, nearly a decade. He's only 30. He's had an incredible career so far. It's the first time we've had him on the show. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Ludwig Svenestal. Thank you very much. Very glad to be here. It's brilliant to have you on. I can't believe we've made it this far without having you on the show. Um, and when I was digging through, you know, what we were going to talk about today, I had so much that I'm not going to fit it into one show. So we will do our best, listeners, um, but we might have to get him back in the future. So I will start, Ludwig, with what we always ask on this show. What are you drinking? A cup of coffee. A little bit of a lunchtime caffeine kick. Yeah, exactly. Just had a bit of lunch. Having a double espresso now with some milk. Very nice. Oh, sounds very civilised. Um, perfect. Well, there we go. Now we've got that done. That is much more grown up than Tom McEwen's glass of squash. Very grown up for him because normally <laughs> it's hot chocolate and marshmallows, I think. <laughs> with a bit of pea cream on the top. There we go. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, Ludwig, first of all, how was your winter? How is everybody in the team? Uh, as we head into the 2021 season? I've had a fantastic winter, actually. Um, and that will sound so annoying. But, um, I mean, obviously we've been in lockdown in England, but I was in Portugal up until mid-December. And then I came back and we had two weeks in isolation. Um, but, like, I, our win winter really started when we came back from Portugal because... We were in Portugal having a beautiful time, beautiful weather. Um, so it started mid-December. And then we had two weeks kind of at home, not doing much because we were self-isolating because we've been abroad. And then I started and it's actually been, I think it made it feel like now I'm starting competing. It made it feel such a, the winter has been so much shorter because I went to Portugal. So it's been much nicer. Um, I also been very focused on training really hard and with the climate and um, not being able to do anything, it's actually been very nice because there's been no distractions or anything. It's just the pure focus on the training, getting into a good routine, eating, going to the gym and things like that. So I'm actually, I'm, I've had a great time there. It, to be fair, it sounds like you're ready to hit the ground running in 2021. And it's, I guess, going to get that long format under your belt. We'll talk about that a little bit later on in the show. But going out to Portugal, having a long format, competing internationally and then coming back almost fitted it into the calendar really well, considering everything that was going on. Um, and actually, a few short months ready to, to get cracking. And um, let's talk a little bit about, obviously, it is an Olympic year for the second for the second year in a row, but the Swedish team have been has been a big part of of your career over the last sort of ten years or so. You've had seven championship appearances. The confidence, I imagine, in the Swedish team is fairly high. You've had three team medals at the last four European Championships across the last four European Championships. What's the feeling like in the Swedish camp heading into Tokyo? Yeah, I think it's very good. Um, as you say, we've had. We've had, the, 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 you know, since I, I did my first senior championship in London, and that was great. We were very close to winning a bronze medal. Uh, basically had two time faults, too many, and the show jumping, but, like, we were very close. And, you know, and then the year after, we were flying, and what, what tend to happen is that I think we just had been one year short in the planning, so... We all aimed at the the, the, um, the Olympics, and then the horses kind of peaked the year after a little bit, and and you know the year after the Olympics we have been very successful, um, so hopefully we will be now with the Olympics being one year later we're ready, we're in the medal, so we're very positive, and with the Europeans in Le Moulin, uh, we had a great time and a great result, 
Um, so yeah, we are we're, we're going into this year feeling very good. We have a couple of really good horses, some good riders, and yeah, it's really exciting to be honest. Would it be fair to say that the, there's a lot of young up and coming riders sort of in, in the Swedish camp? Yeah, I think I mean I think it works a little bit different in Sweden. You know, like in England, you, you see these young, you see a junior us is jumping around a four star, five star, and like it's normal in England. It's not normal. It's just that people in England are very much in front. I think other countries. So you know, while we see like classes like Brahman in the under twenty five, there's so many English people where they are exceptional at that level in a very early age. In Sweden, it takes a little bit longer, and and so on. So, so I think they they kind of are a little bit, you know, in the higher twenties and so on, and they're really coming through now. But it just takes a little bit longer to get the horsepower, and get the experience, and so on. So, yeah, I think they're coming through, but they're maybe just a touch older than these super young people that's being very successful at the high level in England. What's the eventing circuit like in Sweden? I have to admit, I'm not over familiar with it. What's the the setup nationally? I I guess there's a lot of um, riders that travel into sort of mainland Europe to to compete. What's the actual setup like in terms of the national competitions? I think it's actually quite good. It, it's a little bit where if you compare it to England, the distances are greater between the shows because Sweden is is much much. Um, big country set to distances but like the um, shows that are coming through now is, is really good like I was in, in Sweden two years ago for, in terms home for the Swedish championship and it was fantastic like one of it's one of my favorite shows uh, and we have our old Chefle Kip stuff on Lidbeck building the cross country course and he's doing a super job um, we also have a show in that's hosting the in Ride Europeans and Junior Europeans, I think, this year, which is called Segehua, which is also a beautiful show. Um, and there's some other really good shows as well. And they're doing a really good job. They don't get the same kind of entries as we do in England, but they're actually really, really nice shows uh, with very good facilities and good course designing. Um, so, yeah, it's actually quite good. It's just that it's not, as many to choose from as you would have here in England. And therefore, it's almost, there's quite a lot of Swedes that then go to Germany and Poland to compete. Okay, that, that absolutely makes sense. Um, right, let me ask you a little bit about your your career, because I've sort of alluded to the fact that, you know, you competed for Sweden back in 2012. That was your first major championship. You were only 21, youngest rider at the Games in eventing. Um, tell us a bit about your journey over to sort of make that step up to a senior level. Because am I right in saying that you did Young Riders in Sweden and then you moved over here in 2009 with a couple of horses to Chris Bartles? Is that right? Yeah, kind of. I, I, so I did the Junior European. Um, okay. With a, with a junior horse that I had that was very good. Then I sold her and, and I got some young horses. Um, and then I, I decided to, uh, it, my first thought was to move over to England to study. And I was meant to study at Leeds University. So then it was very natural to go to Chris. That was at the same time recommended by a good friend of mine. And yeah, so I came over and that was more my plan, you know, to go to university and ride at the same time. And then the these three horses I brought along, which was Shamvari, Alexander, and Livingston, uh, turned out to all be very good four-star horses, uh, and two of them five-star horses. And so it kind of, you know, it all built up very quickly from me moving to Sweden. And at that year I moved, they were quite young horses. They were all six and seven. So they were kind of on the younger side. And then the following year I did then the European, Young Ride Europeans from being based at Chris. Um, and yeah, it, I was then flying from, from that point when I arrived um, from Chris, really. Dare I ask what happened to university? Um, university got put on hold. <laughs> it's put on hold, but it was put on hold for a very good reason. Um, yeah. 
that that's absolutely fair it's i i have to admit it's it's a huge thing to you know move move countries and set yourself up in a different country three horses admittedly going to university but then that was a huge life change in itself did you find it hard um yeah it was quite hard in some aspects but it's also very good because i think it's very sometimes it's easier just you know when you when you move away from home and move so far away you can't be dependent on your parents and you need to take responsibility it's really easier to move a long way away than just move a little bit i feel um so in one way you got a lot of freedom but then it was kind of hard being on my own and didn't know anyone and so on but that said we had a great little community at the chris yorkshire Wellness center and very nice people there so kind of it, it actually wasn't that hard it was i missed sweden a lot in the beginning but then we had a good community there and had some good friends so it then became a lot easier and from obviously leaving universities and and having that sort of dream of, of pursuing a, a full-time eventing career you then moved to mark todd's did that happen directly after being with chris so after chris i wasn't at chris's and training with him until london uh 2012 and being, was there for three years and then i moved to, back to buckinghamshire for a year um and then i decided from that to move to to Toddies um, and went they was there and so it was very nice. Throughout your career you've had some some seriously good horses and you've had some some different horses you've had to make the decision to sell some good horses as they sort of head towards the the sort of the the peak of their career. Talk to me about your sort of the business side of things because that's something that you've been very very good at but actually it must be very hard as well to see horses that you've produced then be the sold on yeah i mean it is hard because it's why why it's hard is that you, you like i've always seen it as a business and from a business point of view it's of course a very easy choice um that there's no question if you should sell or not the question is always that you should sell however it's kind of I mean, what we do is part of a lifestyle i think as well where you devote everything in your life to it you you don't have any weekends off you don't have you basically have no time off everything you do involves around the horses and, and stuff like that so then when you of course then sell it it's, it's very good decision for the business but of course it's from your personal aspiration like i would i really want to win an olympic medal you, you kind of giving that away and that is is very hard but Equally, I think you need to see it from a business point of view and and that you need to make the decisions of how can I take care of my business the best. And that's how I made my choices when I sold horses. It was always focused on what's the best for the business rather than what's the best for Olympic Sun and stuff. And those are two difficult questions. And of course, it's very hard for me and my aspirations to want to win an Olympic medal when I keep selling the horses, but equally I see it as a very nice thing of me being able to work with very good horses. And that also brings the possibility of me working with better quality horses rather than just sitting and riding horses that I don't like or aren't any good. So that's kind of how I've seen it. Yeah, that makes sense. And it is very much, you know, at the end of the day, it's a business, but it's a long-term goal. And hopefully there will be plenty in, in the future that will be coming through and you'll be able to... It's good to have a choice to make, isn't it? I guess at that point of having the horses good enough to to be able to sort of look at it with your business head on, but also with a competitive head. Um, can I ask you, obviously, going into to 2021, we've, we've established last winter was a good one for you, feeling really, really excited ahead of the season, which has just started it here in the UK with an elite only competition. Um, but things are about to sort of kick off really into April. What are your plans? Was plan A, so to speak, involving badminton? Yeah, so so I had uh Bella Miss was the plan to go to badminton. Um which obviously is no not now since it's cancelled, but 
Um, the, the general plan with them is uh, Bella Miss is going to burn a market. The other horses are starting a little bit later, uh, trying to be able to peak um, at the Olympics, uh, and they will not really have um, a break in between. So because of that, I decided that I'm going to start them a little bit later and focus a little bit more on the dressage and the jumping. So, yeah. We were also going with them for the Nations Cup to, to Houghton and also to Bicton. Okay, cool. Will they do the short format at Bicton or are you planning a, a long format with any of them prior to a possible team selection? Um, yeah. Yeah, I have one horse that's not uh, qualified yet. So that horse is going to get qualified, hopefully, at this new show in Bicton where they're replacing Bramham. Okay, cool. Um, what about the the Olympics? Obviously, you've you've got a is it I think four horses that are being aimed across the championships this year, but you've also got a European. So I'm taking it that's very much on your radar to to have a horse competing there as well. Yeah, I think so. I mean, at the moment, I have a very strong string of four very good horses, and um, so my plan is now to try to prepare them as well as possibly possible for the Olympics and the ones that are not going to the Olympics will be targeted towards Bali or the Europeans. Um, but I think that, yeah, it's also, again, the same with the Europeans. It lies quite late compared to normal, where, you know, I start starting my season a little bit later to try to build up towards that. Get them to peak at the right time. Um, you've got four very good horses as we've said but in terms of the olympics you, you've mentioned a couple of times in the show that that olympic medal is, an, is a real aspiration you've been to london you've been to rio what is it about the olympics that really makes it one of those those life goals for you um i think it's i mean it's the best show in the world like it's it, it's the, the highest any athlete can compete that it's in a, no matter what discipline you're in, it is the highest winning a gold medal is the highest thing you can achieve as an athlete. There's no question about it, and no one can even question it. That's the best thing. And then you have Europeans, worlds, and so on. But the Olympics is the the highest because it's the same across all discipline. And I think it's also very important that you know some sports have maybe World Cup, some have World Championships. It's all very different. While the Olympics is the same for everyone, which makes it very interesting because it's comparable to everyone can relate to the Olympics. While, for example, badminton, which is a great show but very difficult to win, no one can relate to it. Unless you are a horsey person that's grown up and been to badminton, you can't relate to it. You, you you don't know how hard it is. While the Olympics, everyone knows how difficult it is and how difficult it is to win a medal. Yeah, and fingers crossed that we will be enjoying watching you representing Team Sweden in Tokyo this summer. Fingers crossed that everything goes to plan. Um, Ludwig, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. It's been great. Yeah. It has been a pleasure to have you on. You are also one of the Team NAF Global Riders. Uh, and a big, big thank you once again to NAF for their support of the Cup of Tea series. We have got lots coming up over the next couple of months as well as lots of other shows in store for you on the Echo Ratings Eventing Podcast. Ludwig, a big thank you. Listeners, thank you for listening. And we'll be back very soon with more. Thanks for listening. This is what the Olympic gold medalist Carl Hester has to say on Team NAF job in all of this of course is to be able to say to the experts you know this is what I feel the horse is doing this is what I would like it to look like what do you suggest and I'm lucky to be able to have somebody uh, that I can ask those questions to because of course they are the experts they're the people that I have to put my trust in and the horses you know we want to ride on teams we have to think of safe sport we know that NAF leads the way in that I have this really wonderful relationship that I feel is trustworthy I can ask what I like and at the end of the day it's how our horses look and I mean I think we could fa fa safely say that you know when you look at the type of horses we have and the covering of muscle and, and condition that they're in, that things are really working well for us.